So, in theory, they're an earth-shaking invention, a futuristic wonder train that could reshape what it means to traverse the world we live in floating on dual sets of electromagnets, constrained in their speed only by the constraints of the track they're built on and the people inside them. The concept of the maglev train is a long-time favorite of ambitious engineers and starry-eyed futurists. And for good reason. If gotten right, if implemented at broad scale, the maglev could reshape our entire world, and entirely for the better. So why is it? That in all the world today, after an entire century plus of devoted research into the concept, there are just six maglev strains in operation. For a design that captures the imagination better than almost any other, the maglev has fallen miles and miles short of its fullest potential. And on today's episode of Mega Projects, we're going to find out why. Okay, now before we dig into the engineering and practical feasibility of the maglev, we're going to start with a science lesson. Now, of course, we're not going to go terribly deep on the finer points of the physics here, but for those maglev enthusiasts watching, I'm sure you're going to uh, fill us in in the comments below. Look, at a basic level, maglevs, short for magnetic levitation trains, do exactly what they are described to do. They levitate because of magnets. Any magnetic pole, whether it be in a deposit of iron or cobalt, a specially designed household or industrial magnet, or even just in the front of your fridge, is going to attract magnets that are opposite to it and repel or push away magnets that are like it. It's a simple enough principle. And to illustrate it practically, we can imagine an entire table made up of a magnetic surface. Say you were to drop a metal sphere of an opposite magnetic polarity, that sphere will smack into the table with some pretty extreme enthusiasm and it'll be pretty difficult to remove it afterwards. But if you drop a metal sphere that has the same polarity as the table, it will actually end up floating, because not only is it being held up and away from the magnet directly underneath it, but whenever it tries to fall to one side, it's basically falling onto other magnets that are also keeping it in the air. Now, this is a pretty straightforward concept. You're probably not struggling to wrap your head around it, and the idea that this principle could be used for transport, and specifically for trains, has been around for a really long time. Indeed, during the early 1900s, American inventor Robert Goddard and French-American engineer Emile Bachelet both seriously considered the concept and its theoretical applications for a few key reasons. You see, when an ordinary train rolls on wheels along a stretch of train tracks, it's constantly dealing with friction from the rails, which which, of course, slows it down. It's also got to maintain balance. If you get a train going too fast and then it hits a curb too fast, a whole lot of people are going to have a really bad day. But these problems are alleviated when we consider the maglev. Now, there's a few variations on maglev technology, and we'll get into detail in just a moment. But imagine, as an example, a single monorail that's covered in electromagnets. The surface isn't magnetic if the power is switched off, but as soon as someone turns it on, the rail begins to exert a powerful magnetic force on any other magnetic surfaces that surround it. So we've got our rail, let's add our train, and it will feature a design on the bottom that allows it to wrap around the monorail in a sort of C shape. The monorail too is covered in electromagnets, and they've got the same polarity as the rail, meaning that these magnets don't want to be touching each other. Use a powerful enough magnet and you can hold the entire train floating in midair. And once it's levitating, the train can move very, very fast, using the same amount of energy that it would take to move an ordinary train much, much slower. After all, there is no friction. And in a purely hypothetical sense, this train could also turn and stop much more easily than one that's traveling on traditional railways. Add a powerful enough magnet directly in front of the train, and it will not matter how fast you drive that train straight at that magnet, they are not going to touch. Now, obviously, this would be really bad for anybody inside the train or any of the loose objects that would crash into whatever's in front of them. But even if a maglev was somewhat toned down to be a bit less ridiculous, it would still be a major improvement on any of the railway trains that are currently in use. Ever feel like you're juggling a thousand things at once? <laughs> yes, maybe. Look, life's busy. That's where today's sponsor comes in. Today's sponsor is Squarespace. Squarespace makes it a breeze to create a beautiful website, just like I did, despite the whirlwind of tasks and responsibilities that 
everybody seems to have. Squarespace has many incredible features, but there are a few standouts. First of all, there has to be Fluid Engine. It's like having your own creative genie. You can craft a stunning website in no time at all. And for those moments when you wish you had an extra set of hands, there's extensions. You can connect your website to a whole bunch of third-party tools. And Squarespace, they just released their newest feature called Courses. You got the power to teach and earn with courses all on your own terms. Squarespace helps you create and sell an online course easily. You can charge a one-time fee or you can sell subscriptions. You can take what you know and turn it into income with Squarespace courses. And here's the best part. You can try it for yourself. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial and when you're ready to make your life a whole lot easier, go to squarespace.com slash megaprojects and use the code megaprojects to save a fantastic 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Thank you to Squarespace. And now back to today's episode. <laughs> All right, so now that we've got the science sort of decently under control, let's dig into the specifics behind what a maglev actually looks like. Now, there are two basic types of maglev that people know how to build. Electromagnetic suspension, which is pretty similar to the system that we just described, and electrodynamic suspension. First, there's electromagnetic suspension, or EMS. EMS uses a train and a guideway, or a monorail, both of which are coated with electromagnets that lift the train about half an inch, or just over a centimeter over the guideway. This kind of system has one major benefit that electrodynamic suspension doesn't, specifically that it elevates the train off the track even when the train is stationary or at rest. The only thing that would cause the train to touch the track is if the electromagnets were shut off. Off entirely. This means that EMS star tracks can be simple, the trains can be very sleek, and although early theorists on these sorts of designs had a lot of concerns about train stability, there are ample measures to deal with stability concerns in the modern day. Okay. So then there's electrodynamic suspension. This is where a train isn't situated around a monorail at all, but instead it rests on a guideway that includes a flat bottom and walls on either side. Here, it is the walls that emit a magnetic force toward the train, with the bottom of the walls designed to push the train upward and have it float at the furthest point between either wall, basically in the center of the track. In this case, it's about four centimeters off the ground. The higher section of the walls are built to attract or pull the train toward both sides at once, further stabilizing the train in the center of the track. Now, of course, the trains are made with more than strong enough material so as to not split down the middle, which would probably, again, lead to many people having a really bad day. All right, so there are a number of variations on electrodynamic suspension, or EDS, but the basic idea is the same. It keeps the train floating at the center of a corridor rather than just pushing it upward and away from a single track. EDS has a major disadvantage though, which is that at slower speeds, the walls don't exert enough magnetic flux to make the train levitate. But this can be solved by giving the train wheels or other gear which will eventually lift off the ground when the train goes fast enough. EDS also creates a bit more drag for reasons that we don't need to get into, and because of the way the magnetic field works, hard drives, credit cards, or even pacemakers would be rendered inoperable unless the train is magnetically shielded. This sort of shielding is possible, it's just really, really expensive. We should also mention really briefly that there's also a third sort of design that uses permanent magnets, ones that don't turn off and on, but this design is far less developed. And then there's the question of propulsion. This works mostly the same way, regardless of what sort of maglev train we're talking about. And the critical thing to understand is that a maglev train does not have an engine, at least not like other vehicles and rail propulsion systems. It also doesn't, say, get pulled along by a winch or pushed along by a giant fan or a jet engine or any of the things that might seem like they make sense to power a floating train. Instead, maglevs are propelled by yet more magnets, coordinated to turn on and off at just the right time to pull or push the train in a certain direction. This erases a number of issues around high-speed travel, specifically around getting a powerful enough engine onto a train to make it go at the speeds that a maglev could potentially hit. And, well, talking about speeds, well, what are they? Try about 500 kilometers or 310 miles per hour. That's more than half the speed of a commercial jetliner with all the advantages of rail travel and then some. And even those high speeds, they're merely a fraction of what is possible if engineers don't have to worry about things like, say, curves in the track or the physical limitations of the humans riding on board. 
stupid weak humans. Conceivably, a maglev train can float through the air as fast as you can coordinate magnets to push it along, and with the current maglev speed record already set at 601 kilometers an hour, that's 374 miles per hour, for what is still very much emerging technology, it's safe to say that the design's uppermost limit is probably far, far beyond that. Now, as for actually building a maglev train, the technology also provides some other key advantages compared to regular rail travel. Because the entire train is just floating, often in enclosed tunnels, it should typically experience only very limited wear and tear, meaning that repairs and parts replacements happen less frequently. It's also highly unlikely that a maglev train would derail and they aren't subject to any of the same restrictions on width that a rail car would need to be in order to balance on its tracks. The trains also don't burn any fuel, and the ride is both quiet and smooth due again to what should be a near complete lack of freedom. Finally, maglev trains can handle far more significant slopes upward than a traditional railway train, making them significantly more practical in hilly areas or for quick transitions from above-ground stations to subterranean travel. Okay, so, as state-of-the-art as it may seem, the first commercial maglev actually went into development decades ago, when in 1984 a low-speed maglev opened up at a short route between the UK's Birmingham International Railway Station and the Birmingham International Airport. The Birmingham maglev train ran for about 11 years, ferrying people across a stretch of track that went only for about 600 metres. It was a far cry from anything the more starry-eyed maglev enthusiasts would imagine, but it was a cool little thing in its own right and proved to be pretty popular with its passengers. Unfortunately, it was made obsolete before long and its magnetic systems were plagued with so many problems that by 1995 the whole thing was closed down and replaced with a uh, with a bus. But the first commercial high-speed maglev wouldn't come about for another 20 years after the humble Birmingham line. When it did, it showed up across the world in the city of Shanghai, China. Designed by several German companies and capable of carrying passengers at 430 kilometers an hour, 268 miles per hour, it provided a very smooth, quiet ride that took eight minutes to complete, going from the Shanghai Financial District to the Pudong International Airport. That same ride takes about 50 minutes by taxi. Though the Shanghai Maglev operated only three trains of five cars each, every train could carry as many as 574 passengers, and because of the very short span of track, those trains were able to complete shuttle runs every 10 minutes, with the capacity to transport 10 million passengers a year. The price for that eight-minute Maglev was the equivalent of $1.2 billion in 1995 money, closer to $2 billion today. And across the world, Germany took its best attempt at an early Maglev design in 1991 with a train that it referred to as the Magnet Barn. Meant to travel a mile, or 1.6 kilometers, in a section of Berlin that had been divided by the Berlin Wall, it was able to hit 80 kilometers per hour between its three stations, but sadly, it was a victim of poor timing. By the time it opened, the Berlin Wall had fallen, meaning that there was no need for a maglev in the first place. Predictably, it closed just a year later. Japan's Linamo Maglev opened nearly two decades ago and is currently serving its local community after some early fanfare in the Expo 2005, and it's been lucky enough to stay open, but it too is not a high-speed train, topping out at just 100 km per hour and featuring nine stops on its nine-kilometer journey. South Korea's Rotem Maglev in the city of Daejeon does about the same thing, and the Incheon Airport Maglev, also in South Korea, runs at just over 6 km in length with a top speed of 80 km an hour. China's Changsha Maglev and S1 Line in Beijing are both low-speed maglevs as well, making them, well, just no more impressive. And believe it or not, that is the exhaustive list of all the maglevs that have ever existed in commercial use. And even beyond the lines that did get completed, the average turnaround time between ambitious maglev proposal and quiet cancellation has been pretty short. Take, for example, the Swiss Metro, a project that had hoped to bring every Swiss city within 15 minutes travel of all the others. The Swiss Metro intended to use sleek high-speed trains in excess of 500 km per hour sealed in vacuum or near-vacuum tunnels between 50 and 100 meters underground, but given how the proposal would have cost 24 billion francs, it was ultimately and predictably abandoned. So too was the situation for the Munich Maglev, estimated at a length of 38 kilometers from airport to city center, but cancelled after its costs nearly doubled. A planned nearly 300 kilometer track from Berlin to Hamburg, traversable in just 55 minutes, was greenlit in 1994, but cancelled in 2000 when everybody realized that a somewhat slower new train would be cheaper, and the Metro Rapid, planned between Dusseldorf and Dortmund, faced massive public backlash and questions 
over whether a high-speed maglev really matters at all if it's got to stop almost a dozen times over the course of its journey. And lest you worry that only Germany and Switzerland learned their maglev lessons the hard way, well, there's no need to worry. In the United States, a maglev between the cities of Baltimore and Washington, D.C. went down the tubes in 2002 after public officials learned the hard way that mid-Atlantic suburban residents didn't love the idea of their neighborhoods being demolished in order to get a fast train. The cost was also a major issue, projected at up to $4 billion even before construction would have started, and over half of that money was expected to come from non-government sources. The city of Pittsburgh tried to get their own design funded with the intent of bringing people from the airport to the city center, but as any current resident of Pittsburgh will tell you, the closest thing you can get to maglev travel in the traffic-clogged city is to just run really quickly. Similar projects in California went the same way. Even a low-speed maglev intended for Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia was recently demolished after its tracks sat abandoned for 20 years, cancelled after $6 million were already spent building an insanely elaborate means of taking students across the campus. $16 million. So, that basically sums up the state of the modern maglev industry. One high-speed version and a handful of low-speed trains that basically do the same job as a traditional rail line using maglev technology for no other reason than it seems like it's really cool. By now, it should be fairly clear that a few major factors crop up time and time again in order to stand in the way of maglev projects. Their massive cost and frequent budget overruns, public blowback against building on specific routes, and the simple reality that if you're just after a high-speed commuter train making a multi-stop trip, a maglev simply isn't that much better than just a regular-ass train. But there is one more factor that we've got to touch on in order to fully flesh out why there's so much hesitancy around maglevs. The Lathan Transrapid Collision, which occurred in a small town in Germany in 2006 at a maglev testing facility. In Lathen, the Transrapid Maglev Company had been testing their trains on a 31-kilometer, 19-mile track where the company had been working for years on trains that were supposed to be used in the maglev projects that we described prior. Because maglev trains quite literally cannot collide with each other, again, magnets doing magnetic things, Transrapid had long made a habit of offering tickets to the public for test runs with up to a thousand visitors a day. But on September 22, 2006, a communications failure during a standard test run caused Transrapid's test train to crash into a stationary maintenance parked further down the track that hadn't got permission to turn off the main track and go into its storage shed. At a speed of 162 kilometers per hour, 101 miles an hour, the maglev impacted the maintenance car, leaving 23 maglev passengers dead, while 10 people, including the two in the maintenance car, survived with significant injuries. It was a tragic accident, one caused by clear failures by the test facilities, dispatchers, and employees, rather than by any failure of maglev technology itself. But nonetheless, the incident was so shocking that it forced the end of the Transrapid company. The cancellation of nearly every maglev Transrapid was supposed to work on, and it shook public confidence in maglev technology so severely that the entire industry was set back decades. But after that somber episode, it's probably best to balance out with a little bit of good news, and luckily, we do have some of that to share as well. Maglev projects may be developing at a snail's pace, but even snails do get somewhere eventually, and in the early 2020s, it appears that maglev technology is starting to do the same. For the day's first bit of optimism, we're going to head over to the city of Qingdao in China, where in 2021, a maglev produced by China Railway Rolling Stock Corporation snagged the title of the fastest train on Earth. Capable of hitting speeds as high as 600 kilometers or 373 miles per hour, the Qingdao maglev is reportedly very quiet and easily maintained, and as of now, China plans to take this successful prototype and build a network of maglev lines to run it. Also in China, links between Shanghai and Hangzhou, and between Chengdu and Chongqing, are reportedly under construction. And then there's the Northeast Maglev in the US, which still hopes to construct a high-speed rail connection between Washington DC and Baltimore before extending north to New York City and transforming a four-hour drive into a one-hour maglev trip. In a project that continues to garner significant financial support from the Japanese government, Northeast Maglev is also projected to need some six or seven years to build its train once it gets the go-ahead, meaning that if everything came together for the project tomorrow, the Maglev still wouldn't be available until 2030, and it still needs to get approval from dozens of agencies before it does. But even though area residents are cynical around whether the project will actually happen, it's not been given up on. Lastly, 
there's the Cho Shinkansen, a maglev line currently under construction and expected to run between the Japanese cities of Tokyo and Nagoya. With a planned 285-kilometer initial track that would include nine stops, the Cho Shinkansen is projected to hit speeds of 505 kilometers or 340 miles per hour. The line has been under construction since 2014, with commercial service projected to begin as soon as 2027, although red tape issues in one of the prefectures the maglev would run through has given some cause for concern. The Cho Shinkansen faces a few obstacles before it's completed, not least the risk of building an underground maglev line in a seismically active area, and while the tunnels for the maglev will be reinforced by the time the trains run through it, the construction process will still be risky for workers. At present, the improved L0 series of maglev has been designed for the line and is undergoing regular testing at the Cho Shinkansen's test loop. So. All things considered, the maglev has turned out to be an incredibly tough proposition to get right, from the technical challenges in making it work to the tremendous costs of building a line to questions on whether the maglev is even worth it at all. In many countries, even in China and Japan, where they're most likely to be built en masse, maglev technology has largely fallen by the wayside in favor of conventional high-speed rail networks. In other nations, though, even regular high-speed rail has been an exceptionally daunting challenge, and if a country can't get that right, it's going to be hard for them to turn around and deliver a maglev. So, until something changes, it's entirely likely that the maglev will remain a machine trapped mostly in the theoretical. Perhaps future success stories like the Cho Shinkansen or the Qingdao maglev will change that, if they can work well enough, consistently enough, to undo the bitter taste that maglev proposals have left in many policymakers' mouths. Or perhaps the high-speed trains of today and the hyperloops of tomorrow will simply do the same job better, making the maglev redundant and obsolete. For now, though, we'll simply have to wait and find out.